Long time before today, the sky covered the earth, making everyone crawl around in the dark. The magpies, being proud and industrious, gathered and worked to raise the sky so that everyone could move about freely. They gathered some big long sticks and fighting hard they lifted the sky up. They placed the long sticks on small and big rocks. They fought to lift the sky even higher. The sky eventually split open, showing the beauty of the first sunrise. They were so overjoyed to see the light and feel the warmth of the sun's heat, they burst into song. As they sang, the blanket of darkness broke and drifted away like clouds. To this day, the magpies greet the sunrise with their joyful song. When I was a kid in school, my teacher told me that Australian history began in 1788 when British settlers raised their flags, claiming that they were the rightful owners of the land under the law of terra nullius. When I was a kid in school during the 70s and 80s, my teacher told me that Aboriginal people were primitive hunter-gatherers. My teacher said that Aboriginal people had no purpose, devoid of cultural beliefs and had no real societal structure. But now I know better. The truth is, before 1788, Aboriginal life was complex, sophisticated, productive and rich in culture, law, tradition and connection to the land. An Aboriginal person will say that they do not own the land, but the land owns them. They are responsible for the preservation and protection of the land in return for the land providing food, water, spirit, life and death. Moiety, the representation of the universe as a mirror, reflected the balance between conservation and survival. In each moiety, the kinship system is strategically structured in order to clearly identify each clan member's family bloodlines. And importantly, kinship defines the unwavering commitment an Aboriginal person has with their family group. An Aboriginal child is raised by large extended family members. A child is raised by a mother, father, grandparents, aunts, uncles, older siblings and cousins. The family group and the larger kinship network are obligated to care for that child. And in return, the child is obligated to protect and honour their kin. When I was a kid, my teacher told me that Aboriginal people were unproductive. Early British explorer Charles Sturt documented his observations of grains being harvested and kept in storage by Aboriginal clan groups. Other early colonial settlers observed the sophisticated irrigation systems managed by Aboriginal people, and in Sunbury, Victoria, early settlers observed the Aboriginal practices of harvesting and recultivating yams by building handmade terrace gardens. Aboriginal people also established a trade economy, even crossing the seas to Indonesia, who then passed Aboriginal artefacts and produce further afield through China and even Egypt. So the idea that in 1788 Australia was no man's land was a tragic lie and the beginning of many injustices to come. My teacher told me that the removal of Aboriginal children and the segregation of Aboriginal families was for their own good. In the late 1800s, the Victorian Aborigines Protection Board agreed to a policy of segregating Aboriginal people by forcibly removing them from white settlements and into missions and reserves. It was also policy for family groups, kinship networks and clans to be separated and placed in different missions and reserves. Children were taken from mothers, and the deep, unwavering bond between kin was severed. Many of the missions were run by Christian organisations. Aboriginal belief systems, creation stories, ceremony and rituals was replaced by one God, a man called Jesus, and the linear life-death system between heaven and hell all in the attempt to civilise the natives. Sadly, many survivors of the missions and reserves spoke of horrific violence, corporal punishment and sexual abuse at the hands of government officials or Christian missionaries. 
From the 1920s right up until the 1960s, Aboriginal boys were then sent to work as apprentices or on farms, with the girls being sent to servitude. The policy of removing Aboriginal children for their own protection had one main goal, to whitewash the government's hands of what was known as the Aboriginal problem. When I was a young adult, a Prime Minister once said, we took the traditional lands and smashed a traditional way of life. We bought the diseases and the alcohol. We committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. When I saw Paul Keating in 1993 giving his Redfern speech, I felt an enormous sense of relief. After years of painstaking yet inspirational activism, there was hope that the federal government was starting to acknowledge the past wrongdoings towards Aboriginal people. Throughout my early adulthood, I continued to unearth more and more stories of injustices and racism towards Aboriginal people. But in a sign of hope, I saw leaders from Paul Keating to Kevin Rudd attempting to reach out and heal the past. But unfortunately, there's still a long way to go. After studying Aboriginal studies at Deakin University, I now feel a deeper understanding of our history. But one thing this unit has unexpectedly done for me, it's taught me about myself. I've never experienced racism. I've never had the government try to tell me what I can do and can't do. I've always been free to go and buy alcohol if I want to. I can sit in first class on an airplane without someone asking me if I've actually got the right seat. I can stand in a supermarket queue without getting those side glances and whispers. I can go to a job interview in full confidence that I won't be shelved by my potential employer after they see that I'm Aboriginal. I now appreciate more than ever the beauty, the diversity, the richness and the enormous generosity of Aboriginal people. I'll be by your side as you walk towards a treaty. I'm proud to know that you are the shape of our future. Mm -hmm.